Good evening, everyone. Today is the meeting of the Animal Advisory Committee. It is Wednesday, June 26th, and the time is 6.30. Have all of our members signed in? I would like to have a moment of silence for all of our first responders, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Um, could we have uh, introduction of our uh, new members? So, um, we have uh, Dr. Kristen Day. She's um, a new vet that we had hired. She can tell you a little bit more, but I can remember some things. You went to Kansas for- I, I for did my veterinary school, school at Kansas State. In Kansas, Kansas State, and, but she's originally from this area. So when we interviewed her, I believe she was in Montana um, by phone, but she was happy to come back. We're thrilled to have her. Um, and we probably at the next meeting will have our fourth and final candidate, which we are hiring, um, and you'll get to meet her at the next. So we'll be we'll be full again, having been down to like one, and having getting backlogged from four vets doing surgery to one. We'll be back up to four very shortly. But if you want to tell them a little bit more about yourself, welcome. Um, I'm Kristen Day. I am from Florida originally. Uh, did my undergrad at University of Florida, vet school at Kansas State. Um, practiced in private practice in Utah, and then in Idaho, and then in Montana, um, and decided it was time to come home. Welcome back, Dr. Day, and welcome to the warmth. <laughs> I'm sure that you had a lot of cold weather where you were. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much. Um, the next thing on the agenda, we would like to have an adoption of last month's agenda and approval of the minutes. We can't do that. But we can't approve. Oh, we can't approve it? So then we need to hold that for next month? Yeah. Uh, the next thing that we have on the agenda is public comment, and we don't have anyone here for public comment, so I guess we're going to skip by that. The next thing that we have on the agenda and you need to time me, um, 15 minutes. I'd just like to tell you a couple of the things that I've done within the last, um, within the last month or so. Um, one of the things that I've gone to is the state agency response team, and that is for large animals and for small animals in the event of disaster. Uh, one of the interesting things that I found on one of the law enforcement officers when he was making a, when he was putting on his presentation was the threat that Florida has for bioterrorism on dogs that are coming into our state. And uh, this weekend I was up in Washington, D.C., and it's also another thing that they discussed. Who would think that you would use dogs for bioterrorism? Um, they've also said that they've found dogs that have had drugs um, that have been imported. Um, Madam Chair, if I can just kind of, I'll share a little experience with you. So back in 2005, this wasn't made super obviously known by the world, but there was apparently some sort of a threat. This was around the time when all the anthrax letters were being mailed to congressional and Senate people. And um, we were warned as animal control that we had to carry cephalexin and various other drugs in case um, they decided to put anthrax on dogs and release them as strays in order to, so the bioterrorism uh, for pets has been around for a while. They just have kept it very, very quiet. So. It's, it's just, I could not comprehend this that somebody could do this. But think about it. We live in a peninsula. 
We're surrounded by water. We have land to the north. And if something would happen, we would be cut off from the rest of the United States. It's a terrible thing to think of. Now, the other thing that I wanted to discuss on the um, state agency response team is I did get certified for small animals. And um, the SART people are also going to, uh, they will put on um, educational certifications if we have 22 or more um, people. And in August, they're going to have an online course so that people could be certified for small animal response. Um, there is a problem, and I think that Scott can uh, discuss that with us, on the response on when these uh, SART people can come out in the event that we do have disasters. And I found that there is probably uh, a problem. We're going to have 17 shelters in the event that we have an incident. Is that correct? They've upped that to 22 now. They've upped it to 22. So how can we expect our employees at Pet Resources to be able to monitor 22 shelters? Um, I think that with the county, it's probably an insurance issue on having uh, volunteers. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I think that there are various layers of issues there. It, obviously, they want people that are knowledgeable on the one side, and then they, they want some county employees, but it used to be we only had four, and we were able to staff them entirely by um, staff. Now, you know, I think the thing sometimes people forget is we still will have, at that time of the year, typically four to 500 animals that are in our care, plus whatever else is gonna come in, so I've got to staff a shelter. Rogers people have to be prepared for the post cleanup. And so we made the mistake in Irma of having them in the shelters. Well, they worked 72 straight hours with no breaks. Had we actually been hit, they would have been kind of dangerous driving around with very little sleep. So they're off the table. So now it leaves us with effectively one of our employees per um, pet-friendly shelter for each of two 12-hour shifts. So basically two employees, but only one on it while the other one is off, um, which creates a big continuity issue. Plus, I believe during Irma, we had an excess of 1,500 animals being sheltered, including some that people dropped off without being able to care for them. So they thought we would be caring for them. Well, we can't turn them away at that point, but we were not pre prepared to be caring for people's pets. You're supposed to be bringing your own supplies, your own cage, taking care of them, cleaning up after them. They were expecting us to have vet techs and whatever, and it's not what happens. And it's why I've asked the county to reconsider the whole term pet friendly um, as to more like pet accepting because people's expectations when you say pet friendly are way too high. We want them to take their pets and go, go someplace else, um, leave the sheltering to the people who absolutely, for whatever reason, can't leave. Um, and that's also why some, so many more shelters are being open because we also are going to take all of the first responders' pets into sheltering so that they don't feel like they're worried about their pets being at home, they can worry about helping the other citizens, but that creates, again, new layers of work. And um, yes, I'm, I've been vocal. I am concerned that we don't have enough, enough staffing, but the county is working not only internally, but with like the constitutional offices. So the school board, the clerk of courts, the tax collector, um, I think, like 80% of the Environmental Protection Commission has signed up to work in the shelters with us. Uh, so we, we are getting them. It's just that it's a lot of shelters. It, it's that, you know, four to 22 is a major escalation in the matter of two years. What can we, as members of the AAC, take back to our commissioners so that we can help? Um, I'm not really sure because I think we 
just hired a new emergency operations director about what a month six weeks ago yeah, something it's not month. been very long ago and um, I'd like to give him an opportunity to kind of bring his expertise in and maybe you know give us some ideas of what you do when you've got that high a demand but I think everyone needs to be conscientious of the fact that we really are going to need additional support if we were to get hit and have to open all of those shelters because um, while we've got the supplies and everything that was the easy part um, that was just money and ordering and, and whatever but now the staffing is is a new layer um, and we fortunately were able to partner with the Humane Society on certain special needs uh, that was facilitated by the board so we've got a new layer there that might take some of those animals that were ending up in the pet friendly shelters that actually needed care and the Humane Society is going to help us with those so we're piecing together bit by bit, but I think we're, we, we need to find some pieces of how to get people and whether that's volunteers, whether that's paid qualified people, you know, we just are gonna have to think outside the box and figure out, you know, if we've got vet clinics that are closing down and they've got vet techs, well, maybe those vet techs could staff our shelters and maybe we could pay, you know, I don't, I don't know the, all the logistics of what resources financially and whatever are available, but I know one of the concerns is having people that are um, actually able to handle the work. And a lot of times untrained volunteers, their hearts are big, but they're not anticipating the reality of a, a MASH style shelter um, isn't exactly your most people-friendly environment, and it can be very, very stressful. And in some of our places, weird things happen. So in one, um, one of our shelters, we were also the morgue, the same room. So my employees were in there, and they had someone who passed away at one of the shelters, and they had him in there temporarily, and uh, it kind of freaked the people out. But, the, you know, they got to do what they got to do. So. Thank you, Scott. Um, Madam Chairman, I have yes. a question. Do yes. we now have a quorum? Yes, we do. Yes, sir. So shall we go back to the adoption of the agenda and approval of the minutes? Could I have a motion that we adopt the agenda for today and the minute? That would be first. Lake Chambliss, I move we adopt the agenda for today. Do I have a vote? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Do I have any nays? No. The motion is passed. Thank you very much. And on the minutes from uh, last month, uh, do I have a motion that we accept the minutes from our last meeting in May? Make a motion to accept the May minutes. And do I have second? Thank you. And do I have a yay that we accept the minutes from last? Yeah. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, the next thing on my report was when I was up in D.C. this uh, past weekend, uh, one of, I had a meeting with uh, Ross Spano. He's our congressman. And one of the things that I wanted to discuss with him was the Freedom of Information, or FOIA, that we have in our shelter because we do have a problem. Uh, we have had threats in the past, and uh, Mr. Trevitowski has discussed with me that we have a problem with animal cruelty cases where the people who adopt or the rescues that take the animals out um, do not have protection. And some of the animal cruelty people have gone either to the rescue site and threatened that they want to have their animal back. They have also gone to the shelter and made threats against our employees. And uh, Congressman Spano is basically federal, but he helps trickle things down to the state. And I told him, if it's a problem in our shelter, it's a problem in all governmental shelters. 
that have to deal with the Freedom of Information Act. Um, our local rescues that are private, 501c3s, do not have to give the information, such as our governmental shelter. So I wanted to talk to him about the protection for our uh, pet resources and other governmental shelters. The other thing that I had discussed with him was the importation um, of dogs. Presently, according to the CDC, we are importing uh, one million dogs per year. And there is nothing in the regulations that says that when they have puppies that don't have their eyes open, puppies that do not have their teeth, that um, anybody has to bear the burden of bringing those animals in. And they're coming in with falsified uh, documents. When we export a dog, the dog has to go out with a um, international health certificate and it has to be approved by the USDA. We do not have that same thing when dogs are coming into us where uh, it can be signed by a veterinarian, but it doesn't have to be signed by the uh, veterinarian, which would be similar to our USDA. And I think that all things should be equal. Uh, and the CDC and the US Customs and the USDA should not be bearing the brunt of the expense of animals that are being um, brought in in lots of 20 to 50 with falsified documents. So I hope that we can do something towards that and that will help our dogs that are in the shelters and um, stop the illegal trafficking of animals wherever they're gonna be going. And the other thing that I discussed um, with um, Congressman Spano, he is very big on the fact of human trafficking and he, Florida is third in the nation for human trafficking. And what they found is they have a direct correlation for uh, porns and pedophiles to human trafficking. <clears throat> and I'm sure that um, <clears throat> Mr. Mills, can you attest to that um, in any of your uh, history in, in law enforcement? Yeah, there's ha there has been correlation to that, yes. So what I told uh, Congressman Spano is we need to have more detection dogs, duly trained dogs for the police uh, force. The dogs can sniff out porn. And when I tell this to people, people say, how can they see it on the screen? They don't see it on the screen. These dogs are trained to detect the um, computer components that are immersed in a certain material so that these computer parts are not going to rust or degrade and the dogs identified the uh, smell, the odor of this computer part, and they can find these things in air vents, they can find them behind walls, and um, I am a member of the Manatee Kennel Club, and I cannot tell you how many busts they have done since they do have the dual um, certified dogs, and I think it's a fantastic thing that our dogs are doing. So that was one of the other things that I thought was very, very important. Um, the next thing um, that we have on the agenda is the proposed amendments to bylaws, Article 2, Section 1. We don't have the proposals um, in our packet tonight, so possibly, Scott, um, you weren't here last, um, last month. If you could discuss that with the members of the AAC. Yeah, so I think this is important enough that we can hold off the full discussion until more people are here and we have the actual thing. But what I wanted to do is kind of talk a little bit about a couple of finer points. So, you know, we don't have the authority as a committee to make that change ourselves, but I knew that what I was looking for was to get some feedback so that if I did go to the Board of County Commissioners and say, you know, we'd like to restructure the committee with a certain membership guidelines. They typically would ask me, "Do well, did you take that to the members?" Um, so I, I think it got a little confused that that the attorney said we can't do it. Well, we we can't do it directly, but that doesn't mean we can't discuss it and decide yay or nay whether we would like them to reconsider appointing people as 
a group right now every commissioner gets to pick one person without any restriction and what I was proposing is what several of the county committees have which is you've got certain qualifications for certain positions certain positions are open-ended positions but then let's say we have a vacancy for a veterinarian all interested veterinarians would apply and then the board as a whole would vote so the seven members would get to vote on one or two or however many vacancies rather than that falling on one veterinarian and the the reason there's a couple of reasons why i i think it would be beneficial one there are there have been times where we've not had any representatives of certain functions like when i very first came here we had no cat representation whatsoever on the committee so whenever cat issues came up they kind of came up and went away without any kind of real action because there really wasn't any advocate for it um, we have someone serving now that does rescue but that's not always been the case um, so I think it's nice to get a good cross-section um, and the only way you can really assure that is to sort of set up at least basic qualifications for a certain number of positions. The other problem, which we did talk about the last time I was here, um, was there also can be some issues with potential conflict when you've got um, like two members of the, the Veterinary Medical Society, and if they meet at one of their meetings and they discuss what's going to be talked about at the board or not, it's a potential violation of the Sunshine Law. In between, and I've had two meetings with both the executive board and some other group of uh, veterinary medical board, and, and, and we're looking more at becoming more actively participating. Um, our new chief veterinarian is going to become a full member and attend. Um, we are going to maybe screen those issues with the society before we bring them here because it's great that we've got 10 members but you know lay people versus non-lay people i got to have my experts here um, we always try to have at least one veterinarian here but when we're starting to talk more complex things like whether we do um, FELV, FIV testing for the entire population or a piece of the population or whatever, there's two layers to that. There's a layer that's purely a medical layer, and then there's a layer that will go more into public policy, budget, and things like that. And to me, it's more appropriate that the medical get discussed by the experts and then brought back to the bigger discussion of public policy so we're headed that way I thought the meetings went very well um, I got to meet everybody that was on the executive committee including some people that um, I've never met before some people I'm very familiar with uh, but I have to tell you that meeting made me feel real good I think we're we're headed in the right direction getting um, the expertise when we need the expertise rather than throwing it out and having a couple of vets and a whole bunch of non-vets try to talk about a veterinary issue which I'm not saying that the non-vets can't be involved at part of it but at certain parts it really needs to be a very technical discussion and it also needs to be a discussion of have we done any research into studies articles best practices you know there there's a whole pre-layer that I think should be done before it ever comes to this committee uh, and I don't think it's fair to put the veterinarians that happen to serve on this committee sometimes under the gun of um, well you're you're our expert well you know you're a representative but there's a whole lot of expertise that we could pick the brains of and uh, one of the discussions I did have with them was talking about the voucher program back when it was first founded and we found some of the veterinarians who were working that i have no i wasn't here most of us sitting here weren't involved in it but we were able to find you know i was able to get some better history of 
why it was founded, how it was founded, what things were proposed that died, which were actually things that should have passed because they're things I would like to see in place now. And they were actually discussed. They just didn't make it past whatever group was there at the time. But they, they, when they were brought back up at these meetings, I was like, that's exactly what we need to do. And they're like, well, we discussed it, but it got shot down. And, and so, you know, sometimes we try to engage everyone when in, instead we should be engaging a focus group and then engaging everybody because I think we lose, you know, if we're doing a dog trainer thing, we should have dog trainers here helping us discuss that. Um, dog breeders, whatever the issue is, and then bringing it to the committee because otherwise you've, most of you have experienced an issue go on for months and months and months and it's because we have to keep sending it back to the experts in order to get the information. If we would send it to the experts first and bring it, maybe it only has to go back to them once or maybe they come and are in the audience to help us solve the issue. So. To me, I, I think my intention wasn't to lay out exactly how I wanted. I wanted to lay out that discussion of the pros and cons of setting up a system where the board would screen the applications and then vote on it as a whole rather than you know, each individual person. And we've run into only one that I'm aware of, but we've run into them once in a while where two commissioners want to appoint the same person. And that's kind of awkward too, because then we get stuck in the, sometimes in the middle of that. And it's great that both people thought they'd make a good person, but I don't want to be in the middle of that. So um, that was my intention to put it out there. And I have no no specific of what those would be. I just threw that list together of some ideas so that would generate the discussion. And again, I did understand that we couldn't vote that in. Without a resolution. But what, what I wanted to do was get that start of that conversation so that at some point we could go to the board and say, you know, this committee has hit a point of evolution where we would like to consider a different membership structure and here's what we would like you to consider. Because ultimately, they're going to have to make that call. And they may just say, we like it the way it is. But sometimes things just are the way they are just because they've always been the way they are. And I kind of sometimes like to poke and say, just because they've been this way doesn't mean it's the best way. And why don't we consider what alternatives are out there? Elizabeth Calleja, that makes perfect sense. Should Thank you, Scott. a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay, going on, number seven, the department report. Um, so on the, I uh, wasn't here, and, and just so everybody knows the reason I wasn't here, I had to have two surgeries done in like a week apart. One was seven hours and one was five. I thought I could come back, but after the seven, I survived the five burnt me out, and, and I had to take several days off to recover. My body said... I'm done, and that coincided with the time of the meeting was that second surgery. Otherwise, I would have would have been here. I had every intention of being here. My body said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the pilot program is moving through procurement relatively slowly, way slower than we thought. So we can probably talk a little bit about this next time because it's at least another 60 days before it hits the streets, um, which is also creating some issues for us because the whole idea of this pilot was to get it done during this fiscal year so that we could determine whether it effectively could be made into a program, a different pilot. Well, now we're looking at 60 days puts us almost at the end of this fiscal year. And so if the funding's only been approved for this fiscal year, this whole discussion may very well be a moot point because if you're going to put it out for bid in August and your fiscal year ends in September, um, you know, we, we may just have to scrap this and go back to the drawing board and bring it up at the next um, fiscal year just because the wheels of government move very slowly. 
Scott, ex explain how you think the program would work, the screening of rescues participating. So there's a certain number, there's certain qualifications for the vendors. And so that side we think is easily defined. The other side is that these rescues who are gonna participate in this would have to be pre-approved by us. And, and one, of, one of the business practices, which I really don't find was a great idea, is the vouchers that we currently have for the voucher system had multiple lines, and we're not going to do that with the pilot program. The pilot program will be, and I'm not going to use voucher because we're using that, uh, we'll call them a coupon. Coupon is not the right term, but some sort of a qualifier, and I'm going to say coupon because we all know what a coupon is. An individual numbered coupon that's specifically been approved for a specific rescue for a specific animal. And so it's not a here, go get your stuff done. We want to track it. We want to see um, who's got, who's getting them, how many are they getting, um, are they actually turning them in? Because that's one of the problems we have with our current vouchers is we issue 9,000 vouchers and only 6,000 of them ever get turned in. So we also want to make sure we're not getting a rescue that's hoarding vouchers or hoarding coupons, and then they're not getting the surgeries done, and others are waiting for them, but we've already issued that, and we, we've kind of gone back and forth. And um, so they have to work with us, they have to be known to us, and they would be restricted based on their history with us. So if, you're new doesn't mean you can't participate, but maybe if you're new, you get a couple of vouchers or a couple of coupons until you prove that you're using them correctly, then you get a little, maybe a couple more. The, the rescues who've got long histories of being working professionally, maybe they get 10 or 15 at a time, but we would kind of monitor that through our three foster rescue coordinators that we have. Um, and we're pretty tough on our, on our uh, people. It's about a half a dozen people a year get suspended from participating with us because they failed to follow our rules, not saying that they're necessarily bad people or bad rescues, but rules are there for a purpose. And if you choose not to follow them, we choose not to work with you. And we, we are forgiving, so we will allow them back, but they do get a time basically where they're suspended, their privileges are suspended so that they realize there is accountability and responsibility. And if you're not doing it right, we'll pull back. And when you're ready, you can come reapply. And we, again, we'll start out slow and, and, and learn. So this program, it would be, it's delayed because of the meetings? It's delayed because of the procurement process. And is there any way you can squeeze that in beforehand, or is just no time? It's no. We we tried. We we thought we had it going fast track, and then for whatever reason, procurement felt that um, some of the qualifications needed to be modified. They had to research who they were going to invite to bid. Um, then you get public feedback. Then you got to go back. Um, it, it's where I call um, the downside of transparency. So government moves slow. Be, govern, people want government to be transparent. Well, the only way you can be transparent is to move at a snail's pace so they can watch each and everything that you do. Um, having come from the for-profit sector, it drives me absolutely bonkers because there are things that I think you could do and I understand, I definitely understand governments have abused some of this stuff in the past, and there's reasons why rules are in there. But there are ways, I think, of still being more efficient. Um, you know, you got to, it's almost like a cost benefit. We can be 100% transparent, and it can take us 12 months to do it. Or we can be 95% transparent. And it can Get take it us two weeks. You know, I think there's a, a cost benefit there of transparency. And if if someone abuses that lack of transparency, then you hold them accountable. But it, it's it's really because of some probably some things that have happened in the past 
that were not appropriate. And I think the concern was moving forward, we want to make sure it doesn't happen again. So out of abundance of caution, it got slowed down and they proactively went out and looked for people who might take exception with it. So we would get that up front rather than on the tail end. Um, had we known that was the route, we would have probably proposed it for next fiscal year because I honestly thought I was going to get like six months of this fiscal year in, and it looks like it's on a path for about six weeks of, which is just not going to work. Um, that there's no way I can get a pilot up and even show any results. We could barely get the coupons issued in a month, let alone people being able to get appointments to get the surgeries done. So. I think the pilot is still a, a worthy project. It just may have to be next year's worthy project instead of, of this year, which may require me to go to the board and ask them, because the money has been approved for this fiscal year, not next fiscal year, to consider carrying that money forward, which is not something the government typically does. You know, this budget year's money is this year's budget money. But I do believe if we can make a program that will keep animals out of the shelter and take them away from my already overworked vet team, it could be beneficial. Is this the right one? I don't know. But if we don't start trying some pilots, we'll never find out what works and, and what doesn't. So I don't have a problem bringing it forward to them, asking them to move the money forward. Um, it's just that I think we all thought things might move faster. We didn't see the road bumps along the way. Um, but, you know, that's procurement trying to be as transparent as they possibly can be. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Okay, um, next on the agenda would be other business. And Elizabeth, you are up first. Okay, it says um, euthanasia voucher. I, I wasn't going to discuss a voucher. It's just the form and it's a starting point. I just want to introduce something so that, you know, perhaps before we were to euthanize the animals, there would be a checklist. Um, and um, one of the things, and I don't think that we have one now, um, and the reasons why would be so that we wouldn't, um, so that one vet wouldn't have to ha bear the brunt of the decision, you know, and maybe it could be a decision made amongst a few people in the um, HPRC instead. Um, there's a there's a lot of depression, and you know, vets have a lot of you know, uh, I guess guilt um, having to euthanize animals, and that's one of the reasons why I think this form is very important. The other thing is. And like I outlined in the uh, first page, um, may reduce stress for staff, especially the vet performing the procedure, um, and ensures the animal has been given every opportunity before being euthanized. Um, one of the things I mentioned um, was uh, the chameleon being integrated with uh, Pet Finder. And um, I, I guess Chrissy said that it wasn't uh, available uh, yet, or it was recently made available? Maybe, Scott, you know? I think we did research on that, and I think what their former issues with it have been resolved and nobody knew, so I think we're headed down that path and again. There are a couple of websites that are really good to, put, to post animals on, um, and there are a lot of uh, rescues that are very particular with the animals that you can... Um, you can offer such as like blind animals. They have rescues for blind animals. They have rescues for older animals, rescues for certain breeds and things like that. And I don't know if we're targeting those rescues when we, um, when we go to euthanize a, a Labrador or something like that. Does Scott, do they do that? Yeah, we, we utilize probably close to 200 different rescues, including breed specific rescues and I was trying to find the email I had actually emailed um, a gentleman in Austin who was using some of what you had okay. and I wanted to give you an update because they're actually revising the they're streamlining it so it's not this as, the form yes oh wow and so I, I was going to try to give you the name and everything but I 
I'm having a hard time finding it on my phone right this minute, but I can I can get it to you. So we have reached out to them. Um, a lot of what they're doing, we already do in a different form. It's just not documented. Yeah. So most of our veterinary um, decisions for euthanasia are done by at least two or three, depending on how many vets we have. We'll it'll be a consensus. Our non-veterinary ones, we actually have a committee that's closer to like six or seven people because they don't, they aren't always all there at the same time. So it assures us that we have at least three, but we've got a lot of times four or five people um, making those decisions. And it's just not a checklist like you're like you're right. saying I know this is lengthy but um I was thinking that maybe before we euthanized an animal and to me every animal counts and you know I just thought that uh, perhaps whoever is in charge of the social media or posting the dog out there could actually put down the rescues that they not just like yeah we just blasted it out to 200 people and we have a database and but you know actually took the time to say hey look we have a lab he's two years old he's you know what I mean a little more specific to that animal you know and treating the animals as individual animals you know um yeah the only the I only know it's time consuming I know it is but it's you know, not the t not always time consuming so one of the unique characteristics that's evolved over the last several years is what I would like to call internet shaming and bullying and this has bled into animal welfare. And so we've lost a lot of our dog rescues that used to work diligently with us because when they came to rescue a dog that we thought had a possibility, you know, we weren't sure, but we wanted to give the animal a chance. So a rescue would step up and say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll partner with you. And then they found out that the animal probably really needed to be euthanized and returned it, well, then they'd be blasted all over social media. Um, certain social media people would go after their donors and say, how dare they, you know, they, they, when they turn that animal in, it immediately got killed. Well, they were there to sort of help us screen out what was and wasn't adoptable. Not everything, you know, for, for all the people who might be listening, watching, reading, whatever, no kill doesn't mean 100% of the animals leave the shelter alive. There are humane reasons to do euthanasia. There are public safety reasons to do euthanasia. And there are some animals that you just can't save. You, you try your best. Um, it's why, you know, the target goal right now is 90%. I think that's a fluid number that, that will settle somewhere. But it's never going to be 100%. Oh, I understand. And if you saw 100% of what we euthanized, you'd see pictures of animals going, oh my God, euthanasia was absolutely the right thing for that animal because it was at death's door when it was there. And so what do we do, stick it in a cage and let it die? Well, that's not necessarily very humane in some of these cases. In some cases, it's beyond repair. And I think everybody understands that, but I think the term no-kill has sort of muddied especially when people claim they've achieved no kill. Um, I would probably challenge you to find anybody who's achieved no kill that has not euthanized an animal at their facility if they've taken in more than a dozen or so. You know, any kind of a brick and mortar place that's no kill still euthanizes. It's just that they're euthanizing unadoptable, untreatable animals that it's the humane thing to do. And that's our ultimate goal. But there's a there's unfortunately a segment of the world who thinks no kill means 100%, and that ain't ever happening. If it did, I think we'd be putting the public at risk. I think we would put animals at health risk, you know, highly contagious animals, and we don't have true quarantine, true I, I, isolation. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I, I understand, you know, I think yeah. we're, we're getting there. I think we've got a lot closer with dogs in this community than cats, but cats, we got a neonatal issue that is enormous and we chip away at it every year. We've made huge inroads from, you know, 30 years ago, 3% of the cats or less left the shelter alive. You know, it's up to like 87, but we haven't reached that magic 90. Well, we've reached the magic 90 on dogs for the last three years, but there are still dogs that can be saved 
with the right resources. I just think, it, yeah, I just think that the form, um, it would be um, comforting to know that, yeah, there are here are the, the rescues that they contacted. They really tried and, you know, just I think the public would, I, I would like that. You know, it'd make me feel a lot better and say, look, yeah, you know I what, think the, this the dog biggest, had, was aggressive and this is why, you know, it, the it's a little more specific. The concern that from an operational standpoint mm -hmm. is, you know, I don't know how many pages are there, but let's say it's a dozen pages. That's well, probably I didn't too mean much. For the whole we need, thing. Yeah, we, I just put in everything I could and I pare that <laughs> down to like a one, yeah, one page. Yeah, a one sheet. <laughs> um, but you also have to think that it's got to be efficient in its process because if it is delaying an inevitable decision anyway, um, one of the worst morale killers for employees who are trying to save lives is to come and find a dead animal in a cage that we were trying to save and, you know, God forbid it hemorrhaged or something overnight right. and we all knew we could have prevented that from happening. Well, that hurts our. That's aside why from those cases. Yeah, <laughs> but that's those are the kind of cases that lead to the high incidence of depression and suicide in, in this field. Is that we want to save everything, or or we've been asked to save everything, and you can't save everything. The the key is to find a system that is efficient enough that we're not postponing a decision and taking up a space because it's still becomes a numbers game. And if you stack three and four animals up, animals will be euthanized that shouldn't be euthanized simply because we've now become hoarders. Um, so I'm not opposed to, to that. And like I say, I know that, and I'll get you the name tomorrow when I can be on a computer instead of my phone, but they're working on streamlining it further. I think they were down to three pages in Austin. They're trying to get to that magic like one page because right. We're still euthanizing close to 2,000 animals a year, so that's, you know, 2,000 pages at one page, 6,000 pages at three well, pages. You know. it would be everyone from their department would be, you know, it, it would hold people accountable at least and say, you know what, the person who was supposed to uh, call this rescue, she actually called the three rescues that she needed to call or whatever instead of saying, yeah, I did a blast, and you know what, I do 30 dogs a week, I, you know, I can't. Mm -hmm. You know, just to avoid that, those kinds of um, situations. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, some of them that, that get the publicity lately are ones that are we know are marginal, and, and you roll dice on some of those animals. Um, there have been a couple that have come across my desk in the last week that have done some pretty wholesale scary damage to children, and yet we have people who want to adopt them, and... You know, I think, what if? You know, what if the next time it doesn't bite the kid in the face but gets them in the throat and That's, they're dead? Yeah, it sounds You know, all of us will feel bad that we let that dog leave the shelter. So, you know, I, I, I think we're, we always are looking to improve the process, and we definitely will consider. Um, hopefully we can pick the brain of the people who've been using them, and that's why I opened that dialogue when you, when you presented it to me well, several months ago. Um, and then I asked them how they were doing, and you they know, said we're we're actually reviewing it right now to streamline it. So the one of the reasons why I did present it was because I adopted a dog um, from the HPRC a long time ago, and I was supposed to foster it, but it just became it was a failed foster, as you call mm -hmm. it. So and and she had a bite history, and um, I didn't read the form right. I didn't know she had a bite history. I just adopted her, and then later on I found out, and I was like, oh my god, you know, but. Um, She's the sweetest thing. She never bit anybody. And I'm like, wow, well, how many dogs does this happen to? Maybe she was like, miss, you know, they didn't read her right or, you know, it was a mistake. And uh, I would just hate to see other animals not have the opportunity to, you know, at least go through a checklist yeah. of things. And Yeah, well, I, I would say we're not terribly far from a checklist because we do a lot of this stuff. It's just that we don't have in a checklist format. So I don't know that this is totally foreign from what we're doing. It just would be um, modifying some things. Right. And like I say, I think we can really maybe utilize the work that's already being done down in Austin to save us 
Yeah, that'd be great. If I mean, got that's something always the best yeah. way. You would find somewhere where it's working and steal it from them. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's all I had to say. Okay. The next uh, thing is follow up on any old business. Um, Gigi. The approval of the calendar. The approval of the calendar. The only thing that I have a question on the calendar is um, if we're not going to have a meeting in November and December, what is that going to do to our nominating committee? Because normally it's in November. Or we can have the committee on the 23rd, on the 23rd of October. All right. Then, and then we'll reconvene in January. Okay. Um, can we have a motion to adopt the rest of the meeting calendar for 2019, or does anyone have any discussion? Lake Chambliss, I move we adopt the revised meeting calendar. I second that. Thank you. Do I have a vote of yays? Yay. Yay. Do I have any nays? No nays, but... Joanne O'Brien, I had a question. If an issue comes up, would we be able to call a special meeting of yes. this board? Yes, ma'am. Um, Judy Seltrick, yes, ma'am. That is, uh, that is uh, in, the, uh, in bylaws, the bylaws, in the revised bylaws, that if an issue comes up, then we can hold a meeting and we just have to comply with a 30-day notice. Is this correct, uh, Gigi? It it could actually be less than 30 days if it's considered an emergency. It can be as short as seven, but we like to give 30 days if at all possible. And, and the route you would go would be to contact uh, Gigi as our liaison and, you know, bring to our attention what you think is, you know, because we've got sunshine issues. And that's why we have a liaison to take, mm -hmm. make sure that we're not violating that part of the sunshine. But walking carefully, Gigi can get those meetings set up. Hey, I just wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Yes. So anytime you have a question, we just contact our Miss Gigi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next on the agenda, um, do we have any? Go ahead, topics. Thank you. Do we have any topics for uh, our meeting next, uh, next month? No, is it going to be next month? Yes, it is going to be next month. Yep, July. Does anyone have any topics that they would like to discuss for next month? Um, I do. Uh, Scott, on the um, uh, request for our one-year, two-year, three-year tags, mm -hmm. um, are we going to do anything for uh, people who are indigent and um, that do not go to their own veterinarian at any time uh, on microchipping, or did you think about offering anything like that? Are we going to go to that? So we're not, you know, I guess, I guess my thought is, you know, we had always discussed that every dog should be microchipped. Well, interestingly enough, that was one of the topics that I started to have the conversation with the executive board of the Veterinary Medical Society. And I, and I probably should follow that up to say that the other thing that we've agreed to in principle is that at least one of their membership meetings a year would be done at our facility so that we could share what our facility looks like. People would have the opportunity to see, ask questions. Um, but what we've talked about is maybe phase two of this. Phase one, we've, we, we're going to have to get the clinics and everybody trained in three-year in how the licensing, you know, because right now we've got one tag out there. We're going to have three tags because we're going to have it based on the expiration of the vaccine. Typically, that's one in three years. But what if somebody moves into the community that has one year of their three years already gone, so they technically have two years left. So once we get the logistics of that down, um, we are strongly contemplating making the microchip your tag, and it would simply renew. So that would be how we get everybody 
microchipped is it would be included as your first tag if you don't have one and then from that point forward that's how we would track whether you were licensed or not but it would also help our officers return them in the field which to me is still the number one value of of the microchip is to keep animals out of the shelter altogether because you would be surprised how many strays are only less than two blocks from their home and yet they may be 30 miles from the shelter so we're going to haul them 30 miles back to the shelter and ask the owner to come 30 miles back to the shelter to claim them when maybe right around the corner we could knock on the door and say hey, did you realize while you were getting ready to go to work, your dog slipped out the back door and the fence was open and here they are and just make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, I, I think the era of how many animals we capture being our success rate is long since gone. So finding ways to get animals back to good owners is the key. And I think for us, microchips have become virtually a zero expense you know that we, we're getting ours for less than three dollars a piece and you know the metal tags have a certain cost so when you figure things out in the long haul a microchip over the life of an animal is probably cheaper than buying tags every year for the dog and we still wouldn't we still i personally but i'll say it, the royal we since i'm in charge of of our department still would encourage people to have tags because having their name and phone number or some way to contact is still a huge way that pets get home and a lot of them that we don't even know because Joe on the street picks up a stray and it's got a tag that says, call me if I'm lost. A lot of animals get back home before we even know their strays. And so I don't want to discourage people from doing that, but the advantage of the microchip is it's permanent and if it doesn't have a tag on or the tag gets snagged on something. Um, microchips have a lot of value from an animal control agency standpoint of saving lives a lot more than they're given credit <coughs> for. Thank you, Scott. I have uh, one other comment. It's on numbers. On some of the uh, dollar amounts, we give a discount for the second year but not for the third year. Um, perhaps that could be rolled over on some of the rates that I've seen because people might just get a two-year if they're going to save five bucks on a two-year and then if they don't save anything additional on the third year. Did, did you see some of that? I will I'll look at that again and see where, where that is. Um, I thought we did have a discount, but let me, I'll go back and double check that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Judy Lawrence, I have a question. Since Scott already answered uh, about microchips and rabies for next topic, is that now not going to happen? Oh, for next. Well, because you requested him to talk about that for next meeting, but he actually discussed it this meeting just now. I can do it either way. I mean, it, I again. just wanted to update you that we did have that initial conversation, um, something I didn't touch on at the time. Maybe we could go um, over on the fees. Um, sure. Again for yeah, next. Yeah, that'd give it'd be quick for me to go research. Just that a and quick come back review. With, yeah. Dynamite. Do I have a motion to adjourn, or does anyone have any other topics they would like to discuss? I, I just want to um, take a second to recognize one of the members for work that they're doing, sort of outside this group, and that's Elizabeth. She's been working on studying. Um, spay neuter for me and I literally I haven't read through it all yet because it's like this thick but she's been looking at whether we do clinics whether we do vouchers whether we contract you know all kinds of different ways to get sterilization to the people who want it and um, she's done a lot of work because literally the binder is about that big and um, it's, it's good information. It's stuff that we would always love to do, but you don't always have the time to commit to it. I think she will admit when she started it, she didn't realize how much work it was. <laughs> but, you know, she's she's been doing a, a good job, and I think it will benefit us in the long run as we go back to revisit um, how do we reach those people who want to get their animals sterilized. Let's let's stop talking about mandating it. Let's talk about how do we get services to people who actually want them 
but may not be able to afford them at their full cost, but yet they may not be indigent, so they don't qualify for a voucher. Where's this little gray area of how do we do it? You know, maybe they pay a greater co-payment in the county, pick up part of it, but we'll have that discussion. But before we have that discussion, it's nice to have the background. It's nice to know what other people are doing in other communities. And um, Elizabeth's been working several months and um, delivered me her first Binder. <laughs> I've got a lot more information, and I've got them all in uh, spreadsheets, like Excel spreadsheets. So if you in the future want to do a report, you know, I'll send those over to you. So I just wanted to let everybody know that she's been diligently working, and she even hired people to help her. That's how diligent she was. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Do we have any further discussions? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Okay. I second that. And I have a vote. Yay, uh, yay. Yay. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>